Welcome to the Warren Cycling Podcast. My name is Dean Warren. I'm in Frankfurt, Germany today. And I'm Randy Warren, and I'm in Asheville, North Carolina. Yeah, uh, it's episode because I've got a lot on my mind here, how, how we're going to do our podcast today. Um, a lot of races going on. We usually talk about what we have for our backgrounds that is related to um, you know, races that have happened or other events, and, and we'll get to that. But Romandy, Tour Romandy is going on live right now, and two Americans at the top, holding the top two positions, but the big hitters are yet to finish. Uh, Luke yeah, up to today's stage, which is a time trial. Up to today's stage, yeah. It's a time trial. Um, what, 15 kilometer time trial? So, 15 and a half, I think, yeah. Not a real long one. I think it, it was pretty flat, too. I think it had a gradual um, uphill to start. So, we'll see. Um, Brandon McNulty's already won, what, two time trials already this year, I think? He's wearing the U.S. Stars and Stripes, too. He's the, the national champion. So, that, that's pretty that's cool, nice. anyway. Yeah. So Amanda so Sheffield Jeff, Sheffield said, got bumped to fourth now. Okay. Right? No, no, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. That was the tr- yeah, time check one. Time check one. Yeah. No, he's still yeah, second. Yeah. Still second. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, we'll we'll um, probably be talking still until this finishes if um, <laughs> Brandon McNulty holds on. So um, yeah, yeah, Tour Roman D uh, race in Switzerland. I I did go um, see. I think at least one stage, maybe two stages before, and. It's nice scenery. I was listening to, I, feel, I, I watched or you know the YouTube videos of the podcast. Now it seems to be pretty popular to watch podcasts on YouTube, which we put ours on YouTube too. Yeah. Um, you can still just listen to it. And so Chris Horner's, he seems he must be doing pretty well, maybe, because he seems like he's doing putting up more and more so he must be making money like oh I, I need to do another one i'm gonna make more money i don't know but the the nbc beyond that, i hope he is that's great if he is yeah so. no he has a lot of insight it makes you think about what you know the it's racing that's going on it's good when people make money off of the cycling too because it's the sport we love and and you should be able to have a career out of it you know he he retired obviously he made some money while he's a race racer yeah, but- contemporary i guess in a way because Christian, I mean, he retired quite a while, but he's still, I mean, Bob was doing a commentary as well, so he's very much involved in the sport, but TJ's can't get much more involved in that except for being a rider because he's a DS, a director yeah. sportif and yeah. for EF education in riding in the cars at the races, so, but um, he um, he offers interesting insight, and, and the American touch, on because we, we seems like I prefer, I was telling someone yesterday, I was watching the, um, I think, Roman D and listening to the, we always have British commentary that we mostly listen to. And I just like the sound of a British commentary for cycling for some reason. It doesn't sound as good when it's coming from American accent for me. It just doesn't seem right. It shouldn't be American accent. So, but and we wouldn't um, understand if it was French. So, <laughs> you gotta no, go. that's right. I know. I, did, I was watching, uh, listening to a French feed that, um, I think Tour Bretage or something, and yeah, I couldn't couldn't get any of that. But um, when when you listen to like Christian Vanderveld and and uh, T.J. Van Garderen, and they throw out some American sports references, um, a baseball or a football or something, it, it's kind like of funny because <laughs> yeah, you don't. It, it's like two different worlds. So they don't like no one gets it but us. Yeah, mix it all. But yeah, so it's it's more directed for and actually. I guess once in a while we probably throw in one or two um, American Maybe. sports references. Lions or, yeah, yeah. The, the, the Detroit sports teams and that. Yeah. So yeah, okay. So let's let's catch up on the racing. But I don't know where, when you want to mention because because people are going to be wondering why who's that standing with Randy behind yeah. you. So because because in a way this podcast is kind of be maybe uh, honoring honoring him as far as you he would want us to still talk about cycling because it's a big part of his life and yeah so, george george ahead. christensen long, long time friend of mine george christensen um who i met back in 2000 when i was working for the chicago land bicycle federation he was a bike messenger at the time and i was working on a bike messenger training video and so i followed him around for a day on the bike which is funny because i had a, a the, an office bike i use because I, otherwise i had my race bike there i think that i commuted in on and i didn't want to ride that and leave it because we just 
when you're a messenger in Chicago, sometimes you just leave your bike out in front, you know, and, and just trust mm-hmm. the little ticket. So I didn't. Oh yeah, you don't do throw that. a U lock around a pole or anything like that. Sometimes, sometimes yes, sometimes no. So that's George was showing me that too. Like here, you you just throw a U lock through the wheel and just leave the bike there, and someone could pick it up and take it. And he goes, it's fine, you'll be fine. You know, here you don't have to lock it at all. Here you need to lock it to a post. You know, he's like showing me those things, and yeah, it's an experienced messenger. You find out where those things are because you want to minimize the time you're doing anything. So if you don't need to lock it, you don't lock it because you want to cut down on that on that time. He actually held the record for the most packages delivered in a day i think like 170 or something crazy amount like that you know so um uh but yeah he but he mostly now i mean he's, he has a messenger for a while he's been he's 73 or was 73 this is you know but he passed away he got hit by a, a semi truck in south carolina not too far out of side of columbia and he's traveled all over the world he's a avid listener to our podcast I, I think in my facebook post about it i said oftentimes we would ask questions on the podcast and i would get a message from george telling us the answer because <laughs> he followed racing a lot um he, he did race a long long time ago i guess um but um he's been traveling around the world forever i i in my post people have been posting back responses because a lot of people are seeing the news that he passed away in my facebook post and someone posted a picture from 1980 when he was on a trip in South America, I think it was. And I had never seen him without a gray beard and gray hair. I think he was premature gray. He was in his young 50s, he was already gray. So, but um, yeah, he traveled all over the world. Did he and, post uh, his rides to Strava? Yeah, uh, recently. Not, recently. not, he didn't used to, but just last year or two, maybe. Yeah. And he has George the Cyclist uh, as, a, as a, if you push in George the Cyclist in your in the browser, you'll see a blog that he has been doing since early 2000s too and uh he was yeah it just shows all the places he's been and actually the picture from here um john greenfield a friend of mutual friend mutual friend of ours who does street blog street blog the chicago version of that in um online he pulled the picture off of facebook and put it this picture there and he said when was that from and so i i checked in his blog actually to, i knew the date because it was a, a slow camp and on uh, day four which is our skills clinic day our rest day when george came and visited our camp for just a day and then he, he had questions about what george was doing that day and so i went back to george's blog in 2019 yeah. in in march and was able to read the post of you know what he wrote about that day and stuff and find out where he was because he he was he was a really good blogger and he's a good writer he w- w- was a graduate from northwestern's mcgill journalism school and so he was trained formally i guess in that way and um Anyway, so it's just a real sad time because he knew so many people. He, he traveled around the country so much. He was really involved in racing. He traveled around the tour, following it for 20 some years. He, um, I introduced him to Christian Vandevelde years ago at one point because he had a um, marker, which um, you know, the, the course marker is on from the Tour de France, and he wanted to give one to Christian. And Christian uh, was living in Lamont at that time, or at least his dad and mom lived there. Yeah, both both from the Chicagoland area. Originally. Yeah, right. So, um, so I, I, I put them in touch, and and George ran out, rode out to Christian's house, and gave him that. And so then, Christian said, I thought just talked to Christian the other day about George's dying. I let him know actually he didn't know yet about it. And Christian said he just dug out that marker, that course marker, the day before for no reason. Really? He goes, I haven't seen that marker for years. And then he dug it out and thought about George, and then, and then I called and told him, and we messaged back and forth too about. Uh, George Dyan. So, um, and, and Christian said it was always a great thing because I remember one time Christian was even saying that they were on a training ride around the tour time with his team, and somebody else on the team spotted George. They go, Hey, Christian, isn't that your friend? Oh, yeah. and, they, and they saw him, and then they think Christian's like, Oh, yeah, George. And and uh, Christian had given him at least one jersey, maybe two, and, and it was a garment from his garment years. And and so George would wear that a lot of times when he was going to see, he thought he might see Christian. And so he, he, that is always, exciting for him to see George wearing one of his jerseys that he'd given them. So yeah, so George was an, an avid reader too. So he read, oh my gosh, that was actually one of his things he went, wanted to do is he read, reads all these books about, and he does reviews on racing books and stuff too. So he oftentimes knew a lot more history than what we know. <laughs> and so it was good to have sure. him so like, fact check things we, for when us. We, when we and, were, didn't know who Alfredo Bindo was at the one time, embarrassingly <laughs> so. I, I just read something the other day because it was about Taddy Pogaccia being um, so favored that um, the Giro, it said, once 
paid Alfredo Bindo not to race because he was so dominant that it'd be more yeah. competition. So, yeah. Yeah, I got a couple books I was reading about some uh, after Alfredo, when Alfredo Bindo was the team director, Fausto Coppi and, um, and uh, the other big writer who was back then. <laughs> like that right now, but they I've been been writing books about them too, and Gina so Bartelli. Um, Bartelli, yeah, thanks. Um, and they, yeah, they they actually they, they're both in the Italian team, and and so they were sometimes approached by the Giro saying, we don't want one or the other of you racing as well too, because you're you're dominating the, the race too much. So, um, yeah, it's funny, it's 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 happened before. But yeah, yeah George. So, be the kind so of George is a great historian then on, yeah, on cycling, yeah. a great reference. Yeah. So it's just a sad time right now because of that too. So I, I just wanted to put the picture up to sure. We're gonna honor him honor George, it. whatever we can for sure, and and uh, pay our respects. Yeah. So also too, just always a reminder to to be safe out there riding. It's uh, we don't know the exact circumstances, but anytime you're out on open roads, it's um, some type of vulnerability. Today, you're at risk. Sure. yeah. Today I'm riding in Germany, and I was um, I've got the Frankfurt Eschborn picture up behind me from Sam Bennett one two years ago, 2022, which is he hadn't won for a while. It was with Bora. Things have yeah. changed a lot over the years since then. He's riding for um, Decathlon Azure du Jour. Um, this year he'll be back racing for them and uh, needs another win really to get himself back on track, but. I was writing up the the big climb that they start out with in Grosse Feldberg today, and mm. it was, they added well, that right. Is that the one that they added? Well, they added or? a second loop. They used to always oh. do it once, and now they do come approach it from the other side. So I think that I usually approach it from the more from the west southwest, and this is more I don't know southeast maybe is. I don't think it's quite as difficult from this side. Um, but still, it's a bit, pretty big climb. You go from I don't know four hundred feet in Frankfurt elevation and then you hit up about 2900 I think I saw on my computer oh, wow. so it is a big climb yeah but it's pretty gradual as it gets there's some steeper pitches they I took me a lot longer than, than I thought it would take. I, I didn't remember how, how long it would take and so okay. and that's the kind of climb that's in a sprinter's race in yeah Europe. exactly yeah so I think well they added that they they tried to make it a little harder more difficult and last year also, I think because just the way the racing is now more aggressive, it was a breakaway that contested the win in Soren Carl Anderson won last year. So yeah. um, and he's that's coming up next week. On racer, so plays, yeah. Plays, plays to someone like Soren Craig Anderson's um, strength. Style of racing, too. Yeah. Being aggressive, right. being in the break, being a strong rider who can win from the break. Sure. Yeah. Well, there, there so will. May 1st, and you're going to be there? May 1st, no. I'll be there. I'll come back. I'll go home and then come back again. And yeah, now that we're staying in Frankfurt, I used to have to ride from Mainz where we stayed or Wiesbaden, try to catch some of the race and then get to the finish and then have to ride back. So now the finish is just about two miles up the street from where yeah. we're staying. And actually from outside my window, I can see where I wrote today, the top of Grosser Feldberg. There's a couple of TV oh. towers. Actually, they don't ride to the very top where the TV towers are. There's a little road that just goes up to the top because they they that just ends up there so they wouldn't go up and look through the parking lot just for <laughs> getting to the very top they'll just go higher, yeah. just straight on over it, right um three americans are slated to race which sometimes there are no americans larry warbass was there a couple of years ago um a few years ago it seems but anyways this year nielsen paulus is supposed to make oh. his return to racing yeah so i'm looking forward to maybe get a chance to talk to nielsen now how he's doing coming back from his knee injury. And I also saw Lawson Craddock on this preliminary start list and Riley Sheehan. So it'd be interesting mm -hmm. to talk to Riley. So uh, Riley, oh, what a transition he made. And fortunately for him, he is not still with Denver Disruptors because uh, bad news on the American racing front, which oh. continues to get worse and worse at the NCL decide to cease um, the races this year, maybe come back next year. So the no National Crit League, which had been revived. I thought they had like NBA National, National. I'm sorry. National, not the National Crit League. I think it's National Cycling League. National, NCL, right? okay. Yeah. Because because that's the name that was, there was a previous National Before. Cycling League too. Right. So yeah. yeah. 
but I thought they had like some good backing between with like some NBA or NFL players. Right, their own the teams. Yeah, it seemed like they had a structure that would be sustained. Wouldn't I mean it wouldn't stop mid year. You know, at least they could make it through each year. But yeah, it's who knows. It sounds like it was abrupt. It was like a four minute Zoom call where they took no questions and just told everybody that everybody was laid off and and so people are scrambling. You know, so the, Johnny Clark. I haven't talked to Johnny personally, but Evan, you know, we have a lot of mutual friends too, and he's going to freelance and just ride forever. And he's a naturalized citizen too. I right. didn't realize that. Yeah, so yeah, he, I saw, he saw that. last year he raced at Pro Nationals. I'm like, how did he do that? He must have become a citizen, but he he did. And he's yes. You know, he's been living here for. Oh, I saw USA Cycling now made a provision to allow these racers to race in the national championships without being affiliated with a team. Right. For you only be part of the team. So they they did act pretty quickly on that, at least. Something yeah, like USA Cycling did pause yes. there. Right. Yeah. And, and so Bonnie's the technical director. Who, she was one that was quoted on that too. She's a racers person too. I mean, she's she's not a, a you know a technocrat where she is just trying to enforce all the rules. She wants to encourage racing a lot. She generally loves racing and has been involved with it her whole life and stuff too. So I can see why she'd be behind that kind of move just to make sure that these you know she wants racers to race and so she's not going to make it harder for people too and I, I do appreciate that and in USC cycling i think is having tons of challenges in lots and lots of ways but they are doing a good job with you know some of their elite support and that kind of stuff too so another friend of mine today he was, was a mechanic for uhc um and he's going to go over with uh, the u23 team i think that's going to go over in Europe on one of their trips too. And so they're still doing a good job, I think, of supporting our budding. Um, once you get to a certain level, I think it's harder on the lower levels for them to do much support because they don't have a lot of infrastructure right now. But at the higher levels, I think they're supporting in well. some ways. Yeah, giving people opportunities yeah. and stuff too. There is a U23 race as well going on in front of the elite race. Oh, with yeah. the Ashbourne Frankfurt, so maybe. Well, Adrian actually said he was going to, maybe his junior race he's doing because um, Barry, the Barry kid, uh, was, uh, I think his name was, was his first name as being as an A. But anyway, he's going to be on the trip, you know, too. So, um, which is, he's been tearing it up. You know, he's been oh, yeah. winning races in Europe and as a 16 year old. Yeah. Yeah. In the, in the, in the, you know, 18, you know, people are eight, two couple years older than him. He's doing really great. So that'll be an exciting trip for Adrian too. Absolutely. All right. We're jumping around like we normally do as we, <laughs> as my son says all the time, you know, focus dad, <laughs> don't get distracted. <laughs> so yeah, well, that's we'll the start way our minds work, I think. That's right. One thing leads to another. We, are, we were talking a little bit about the um, uh, look at that Luke Plapp. Or Luke Plapp who made the difference in the stage two yesterday. It was a category two finish climb. Yeah. And I was just looking at his results because he's the national title champion of Australia. And he finished already of like 58 seconds behind McNulty. So, oh, okay. I didn't see him. 58 yeah, seconds behind? 58 so. seconds behind. Oh, yeah, there he is, 27th. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, I think maybe the biggest challenge for Brandon might be his teammate, Juan Ayuso. Ayuso is in good form. Yeah. And he's good, really a time trial, too. So, yeah. And, they, and they're not going to like, you know, it, they're all good no, he's not going to slow down to let his teammate win. <laughs> no. no way. He should not do that, yeah. Unless, unless it'd be like, you know, a marquee teammate that you want to, you can market a lot better, the team might tell him, but no. Yeah, well, that's great. It's, it's fun to watch that. Stage one, Azure, well, Decathlon Azure, let's say it that way, um, where they, they've got 11 wins this year. They've already exceeded oh, how many wins they had last year. They've had a great year. But um, I was listening, I guess the difference between like Chris Warner was saying, yeah, the, um, was that Van Damme, Van Dram, their uh, Italian fast finisher, who would have been maybe the, the guy that they would lead out for that stage, but Dorian Gordon yeah. had a higher placing after the time trial, the, the prologue. The prologue. It was a true prologue too, so yeah, 2.28 uh, kilometers. Yeah. Took so... Him the, win the winner, less Gordon than was, was would get the bonus second. So if Van Damme had passed him, which was faster, 
he would have maybe not put go down in the leader's jersey. Maybe he was further back that he wouldn't have gotten to the leader's jersey. Godin was fourth place in the prologue, just three seconds down. Right. So that so that win got him. But then I was listening to I think a different commentary about the win, and they're saying, you know. They weren't saying, oh, that's why he didn't like go faster. He was celebrating the win to try to pass him as a lead out guy because he won. He knew that Godin could take the jersey by winning. So, yeah, yeah, and because he got a, you know a ten second, ten six and four bonus, so that gave him, yes. you know, and so then that that bumped him up right there, ten second bonus time too. But also gives him four seconds over second and six seconds over third too. So no one else is gonna have it. And it was in his Johnny Johnny Vermish too, who was um, third, who's a good sprinter for sure, and not. I don't know where he finished the first day, but he did, it wasn't he wasn't in the top people though. So it is interesting that Julian Alaphilippe though was third in the prologue. Right, right. He's he's been riding faster, faster. <laughs> exactly what you say. Um, riding a better form, but then yesterday he was gapped on that category two finish towards the. F- he, he lost. There's all kind there. of two rumors right now that he's going to join Colfidus too, and yeah, he does join Colfidus. They said that it's not a retirement home for him. He's going to come there. Right I see Juan Ayuso now. I'm sorry to interrupt you. 2027, 20, 20 seconds behind Brandon McNulty. Oh, all right. So only the finish. What a couple of riders is all. I don't know. I think it's looking pretty good now for Brandon McNulty. Yeah, get another win. But for the mustache, I guess he'll wear that mustache all year. They're talking about it. He, did you hear the story? It was like he was getting ready for New Year's and he didn't shave. And then he just like shaved and left the mustache just for fun. And they liked it. And they said he was going to keep it till, I don't know, the beginning of the season. I don't think it, it was going to be like keep it till he went. I mean, because he already won, but he's keeping it now still. So, yeah. He's, he's I think they just getting... posted him as being the winner. So I wonder if it's, it's done now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just see it flash there too. Yeah, yep, Brandon McNulty wins. Wow. Yeah. That so stars and stripes. I'm looking to see. Um, so he, 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 he also won the, the Grand Prix of Miguel Indurain. Oh, that was a cool race, too. That was, that was oh, fun. Oh, that was, yeah, well, that was, yeah, that yeah, was he was on the front. He got fast and he won it fast again. So, yeah, but it wasn't so a time I trial, think either. that's his third time trial. I think he won at the UAE tour, right? Uh, stage three at Perry Nice. He won the time trial there. Right, team, time trials, I think, team, team time trial. Team sorry. time trial. Okay. Team time trial. And then he won, I think, at the UAE tour in the time yep. trial. Stage two, the individual time trial. He won that one too. Yep. And then wow, he was, and, and then he was the GC winner at both the uh, um, the Valencia too. Right. So. But this this is a, a time trial win in a world tour. Race. World tour race. Yep. So that's that's big. That's big. Yeah, he's on good form for sure. Yeah, but I thought he lost like twelve minutes on. One of the earlier stages. He might be out of the GC. I didn't look. Yeah. See. All right. Well, Brandon McGulty, congratulations to happening right away. Magnus Sheffield was second. Second, too. He held second. Wow. Oh, that's really good. I wonder. I see, see, Mateo's now locked up the one. We got three Olympians going, right, for cycling. Three, right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And Which they have to, one more than usual. in addition to time trials or not? Uh, your time trialist. I think has to come from your road people, unless you get an automatic. Then, then maybe if you have, if you have a bonus person, then you know it doesn't. I don't know. You know, if you're world champion or. You know, you or do, do you think Brandon McNulty would be? Yes. Someone they'd want to have, and maybe even Magnus Sheffield. I don't know how you gonna pick the how you gonna pick the three guys. Wow. <laughs> well, we already got the one, Matteo Jorgensen. Earned his yes. automatic bid by his um, Doris Door Flunder in that win. So, all right. Well, that's Tour Romandy. Uh, still big queen stage coming up. Um, riders putting in their last uh, efforts, I guess, before the Giro starting. I mean, the queen stage too. Yeah, I mean, that's that stuff is three, uh, two cat ones climbs in it, including the finishing climb, 13.8K at 8%. So, that was kind of the tour of Turkey's today. It was a was a Cat One climb. It was fourteen point four k, like seven percent too. So, yeah, and Frank Vandenbroek, yeah, and DSM Firmerick, who they've got some wins lately because they were, yeah, kind of hurting for not getting many. Two and got a second place uh, over the weekend in Liège by San Liège. Oh yeah, everybody seemed really happy about Roman Bardet getting yeah. second, and it, it was almost. I mean, he, he was like celebrating too with the win. Like, to win, to get second place behind Terry Bogaccia from a big breakaway is like, it's like a victory, isn't it? 
Yeah, yep. And it was fun because it's hard because Ben Healy made that attack, and then Bardet bridged up to him. It looked like they were going to fight out for the rest of the podium, you know, and then Healy cracked, I guess, and couldn't do yeah, it. Yeah. But then Bardet, so that made it even harder for Bardet, yet he was able to still ride strongly. And, yeah, and there was too, just I, a I, actually, margin. Yeah, it was interesting because I listened to that race when I was driving back from Michigan. I, so I, you, were, you had the video going, but you were just listening. Yeah, that, yeah. The, yeah. The video was going, but it was the phone was off to the side, so I couldn't actually see it. Yeah. But um, yeah, and it was great. I streamed it because I have unlimited data now, so I I was I was wondering if I was gonna go to the slowdown mode and wouldn't hear, or maybe the where I was driving through some little bit of mountainous area. But no, I was able to get a pretty good stream the whole time and and listen to like an hour of the of the race. So and like the commentary is so good. Again, that British commentary that I was able to you know really feel like I was listening to a you know radio broadcast or better. So it was good. Yeah, yeah. I think. I was talking to Darren Dowling about that. I went to watch, um, I think, Perry Roubaix with him for round of unfilling. No, Perry Roubaix this year. Um, that I would like to hear sometimes, like, just a commentary, like a radio broadcast of yeah. cycling races, not just, you know, what. And also sometimes if you don't, you're not getting a good stream, a video stream or, just less data. Somewhere. Yeah, just less data. That would be nice just to, if they had like an audio version option or something like that. So the one time I was in Italy with Max during the Giro and we were driving places, he would have it on the radio. And actually sometimes it was hard to find because you'd have all these soccer matches that were playing all the time. And if you find the Giro and then if it was a stage that was just going to be a sprint finish, something like that, we, when he got close to the spot that was going to be the sprint finish, we'd pull off the road into some business, you know, like an ice cream shop or a bar or something, and then watch the finish, and then we jump in the back of the van and <laughs> go wherever we're going. So yeah. having the, having the, it was like, you know, it's kind of like if you're at the race too, you listen to it until you, you, you to watch the finish or whatever, and then you watch the finish. So yeah, and did that following the tour, listening to it on the radio. It was easy to find on the radio. Just couldn't I never understand yet any of it. Just when they say names, hard. when they say names, you can understand them. But yeah, that, yeah, it was very frustrating. Like. Don't know what's happening. Trying to figure it out, but no. Nah. Especially when they get really excited and you're like, oh, what happened? What's, you know, so. Yeah. But also, too, I mean, if you, do you want to jump real quick to Liège? Because that was like Matt, Matthew Vanderbilt's, you know, his his role was crazy in that race. You know, he, he at one point they were saying, oh, his jersey's unzipped. He's rocking his shoulders. He doesn't look good. You know, when he was in the third group behind with Pickock and then Pickock. Yeah, he went back to the car to drop his stuff in the car. And he wasn't, you know, being, this was like what under 100k to go when it was starting to heat up and then the crash yeah, yeah like blocked the road yeah yeah and then they said they just didn't look good too and 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 i didn't read the article but pickock said that he had his highest power output in his career was like that in that race and he, he and he because he made a huge move to bridge up to the second group well you know when Picacho was off the front already so um but yeah and then Wasted a lot of energy, apparently. And then but Vanderpool. The, but the, what, was the, what was the discussion about the cars not pulling out the cars and yeah. the cars helped the the group catch it back up? Well, yeah, there was a, I forget what the DSM writer was. There was what not. What they called not, a barrage? Oh, no. It was not Bardet, but it was another DSM writer who was in the gap. And, and when Pickcock and a few people that were with him were going, so he, I don't think it helped up had helped Vanderpool that much, but um, it did it did save a rider basically just to be in the pickaxe move, and then it was a little questionable in terms of people not pulling out in between that move for a little while too. So, but yeah, the the, the announcer was saying it was very clear that the DSM rider was motor pacing behind the car way too long, and then they were in being in that move, but it didn't end up being moot in some ways because. If they if that group would have caught on and Vanderpool's group would not have caught on, then it would have been a much bigger deal because then it would have been a smaller second group and and um and Vanderpool in that great group wouldn't be spreading it out, you know. Because I mean it was you know Ben Healy was last in that group then and he was this this group that was sprinting for uh third and he was twenty seventh. So the, the group was fairly big where it was gonna be like you know, less than a dozen otherwise before that. But yeah, we have one just had Matthew Vanderpool. Once he got on, yeah, I mean, he had teammates and they started working again and he started looking good and then won the sprint finish. I, again, I didn't get to see the sprint 
finish really because I, again I wasn't watching the video, so I get to hear it a bunch of times. And then uh, I think I was at a rest stop and I glanced over real quick to see if I could see part of the sprint finish. And it was oh because I guess the guy almost crashed to the right of Vanderpool after he finished, so he came up fast and tried to weave through a couple of guys. So I I, I did see that when I was stopped to, to see something, but um yeah it was but it was amazing that, that that race formed the way it did so if you see the results a lot of times it's just so much different because you feel right. like oh, of course Pagato went off the front you know of course and then Bardet somehow was solo off that and then Vanderpool of course he won the sprint you know it was, it, it, but no he was pretty much out of the race at, at like 80k after the crash and then up until I forget when they caught on but it was really close to the finish oh, they caught yeah, on, almost so. to the finish yeah yeah for sure so, but and and then again it's always it's been highlighting with these big long range of dominating attacks and wins by Vanderpool or Pagacha, who I think yeah. what the last ten um, monuments have been won by those two riders. Is that what I heard? Oh, I don't know. He, uh, they, they each won six now, so yeah, they're tied with six apiece. Um, yeah, it's uh, so you either got really good excitement for second place, or the excitement has been more in the women's racing. Which has been yeah. a lot more balanced, less SD works um, dominated, yeah. and Grace Brown. Ah, this, well, real quick, just uh, on the men's real quick there too. Just I want to give a shout out to Kevin for America because he was oh, the first yeah, marathon was, at twenty third, sure. and he was in that group, and he was doing a lot of work too for DSM. So he kind of helped be a key person for Bardet to be able to not have to do the work, so he had energy to be able to get off and get second place so. right he's he's been strong all spring posting very yeah. nice results and yeah. and the, um michael berry's son is ashland berry we were ashland oh, trying yeah, to get they. his name ashland berry and, and he won uh over last weekend the henderson classic in canada yeah so, so yeah we can talk about grace brown for a second too yeah i didn't get to see as much of that because that was already over when i was streaming so uh, yeah well she would i mean it's phenomenal to, to have her be able to beat Lisa Longo Borghini in a sprint. Yeah. Well, it was more phenomenal that she was in the break for a long time as well. And she kind of well, went off to the grass and came pretty much to a stop and had to chase back on oh, yeah, to be able to sprint. Yeah. How far to the finish was she? 7K. Oh, that's well. yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. You see that Mariana Voss won the sprint for end of being seventh, but you know, so she's still riding strongly. And then uh, Sylvia Persico um, won her group sprint for 13th, but they're a couple minutes down. But still, you haven't heard much from Sylvia Persico before, you know, recently. And she's, you know, really came out and burst on the scene in the last couple of years. And I'm sure is getting ready to do, um, you know, she's a good stage racer. So getting ready for the, the Volta. Yeah, the Volta. I know it's weird. The Volta is the first of the women's yeah. stage races, so. It's coming up. Yeah, yeah, and and then Neodoma again was in that move too, so she was fifth. Um, Demi Volring, so SD works. I mean, Volring's a good, decent finisher. I mean, she beat Lada Kopecky and you know Stradivari two years ago, right, last year. So yeah, it's Volring like, you know, is still without a win too, which is amazing. This who's without a win? Volring? Oh, she was not a win, really. Without yeah. a win so far this year. Yeah, yeah. So that was yeah. So yeah, it wasn't like yeah we couldn't say it was a lucky win for Grace Brown obviously she was she was super strong to be able to put that and it's good to see FTJ Suez actually get the win too because you know we want to see we get used to SD Works winning right well, so Mariana Vos. Voss has won for for Visma Lisa bike um, we had yeah. Cassie Nui Domo winning for Canyon and uh, yeah FTJ Suez gets a win too in a big race so, yeah very good yeah. Well, I didn't take notes, but I think we've covered. Oh, we need to do the mountain biking stuff, though. So, so mountain biking. Oh, the mountain bike stuff. USA oh, yeah. That, there was, yeah. I, and we're not, we were talking a little bit before, too, about the demise of the cycling industry with the, oh, this yeah. recent. But I don't think that, I think that's a separate podcast. I don't think that's, and we've already got enough sadness going on in our podcast today. So we're, we're not going to touch yeah. on that. But yeah, but the, oof, if you want to go to the mountain bike side, which, can't find any coverage on Velo website. Had to dig around, but um, the first two rounds of the World Cup in Brazil. Yeah, well, I, I think the okay. The other uh, there's one other bad news <laughs> that we have to mention that the cyclocross um, will not have a World oh. Cup in the United States this year. Yeah, uh, it hurts yeah. a lot because yeah, and, and 
a lot of the Europeans were happy because they they're like, we don't want to have to travel. And the season starts so much earlier. I mean, now it starts. The first World Cup race is like end of November, or it used to start in September, mm-hmm. you know, right. in the U.S. So it's a it's a yeah. So. Um, but they'll still have a big a big cross weekend, and hopefully and they, the national series in at Waterloo and at the track. And they can still be star races. They just won't be yes. World Cup races. So. Right. You want to have the, yeah. some of the stars come over. Which I think hurts. I mean, that's you know, yeah. I mean, Trek obviously wants to have it at their at their factory, you know, in Waterloo, and then Fayetteville or Bentonville, rather Bentonville, or no, it's a Fayetteville, Fayetteville, Fayetteville's course, yeah. you know, is is a world class course they built specifically for hosting cross races, and expect to have you know world class racing there too. So it is hard for those guys not to have it. You know, with Jingle Cross isn't happening anymore, but that you know also was a race that like to have those races too so yeah it's a little sad for sure you know but hopefully right. uh yeah it just changes things a little bit tivo nice but yeah so mom like so yeah so 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 christopher blevins who won the world championship in the short track which is cxx <laughs> and the abbreviations um won i think that was his first world cup cross country win wasn't it in in, in, the, in brazil the first week though and we did really well. And I, so I'm not sure. I'm wonder if it's in, in the two weekends back to back, basically, of, of in Brazil. So both weekends we did well. So I'm not sure. Especially, especially the under 23 level. Yeah, Definitely. under 23 level. And that, so the first race, too, um, yeah, Riley Amos and Bjorn Riley um, were took first and second. And then the woman, uh, Sylvia Blunk and Hadley Baton took second, Batten took Hallie second Batten, and yeah. third. Yep. And then in the Short track, Riley Amos. Uh, also, we won both the the cross country and the short track, and then Bjorn Riley was U23. fourth in that one. In U23, yep. In the women's U23 too, Megan Monroe, uh, Mad- Madigan Monroe, Maggie, Maddie, 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 Maddie. Anyway, so she was second in the U23 short track, and then Sophia Waite was third too, and Kate Courtney, former world champion, former world champion. yeah, in the yeah. cross country Olympic um, CCO XCXO. But she was fifth in the short track too. So that was a good that, was, that we we saw that first. We're like, oh my gosh, how well did we do there? We did great. And then the next weekend, <laughs> um, this past weekend, they, yeah, yeah Haley Baton Baton won first, and then uh, Savelia Blunk was third in the women's cross country uh, Olympic. Riley Amos won again both races in the in the men's um, 23, the the under 23, the the short track and the cross country. And then Bjorn Riley was second in the short track and fourth in the uh, cross country. So, and then uh, you know I had Haley Baton Baton won, of course, the uh, short track too. So, I was say Baton. Is that, is that like uh, um, T.J. Van Garden was mispronouncing Pogacha, and Christian yeah. Vanderbilt he was saying Pogacar, like we used you know used to think it was at the beginning. But um, Christian Vanderbilt was writing. Steve Perino used to go. He was on the motorcycle. Young for NBC would go find the parents of the riders oh, and ask them how to pronounce the name. That's and good. So he got Pogacha's parents. So they that's how they got the Pogacha. So then uh, I think um, TJ said it once or twice correctly, and then then later on he wasn't saying it correctly. And yeah. I have to be careful too with um, Sven Nice and his son now Tibo Nice, not saying or Nice because they're always yeah. saying Nice, but it's Nice, I believe. So yeah, Tebow, he, and he, and he won. He won, won yesterday's stage. Yeah. yeah. So and he's still like 21. I I knew he was young still, but some yeah. of these writers, I can't believe how how much they've been in our our consciousness for so long as you know being good riders already. That he's he's getting a win now, a world tour um, stage yeah. win. At, and at and just he has his first World Cup cross country win in Waterloo last year. So you won't have a chance to do that again. Yeah. But Christopher yeah. Blevins also, too, Blevins also had a short track second place, too, at the second weekend. So, so yeah, I mean, and that's tons of points for that, too. It probably helps them with their Olympic qualifiers and, and mm-hmm. positioning for that, too. But, um, yeah, I'm hoping to go see one of the cross-country, uh, well, cross-country Olympic have... race. But I've not seen tickets for sale yet, though, the Olympics mm-hmm. for the for mountain bike. So I'm I've looked at the road race course. Have you looked at the road race course? No, it's, I know, it's supposed to be flat, the Spinner's one, basically. But then so was London, and that came no, down. No, the road race has some some hills. They race around the um, soccer core area. Yeah, but the, your, the, Frank, the Frankfurt race has that super long climb, and that's the Sprinter's race, too, right? So, 
Yeah, I think I think those hills are going to wear them more like. Okay. Yeah, it'll be yeah. more. I don't know. I think they're going to be more severe than the like the Richmond course, the Richmond Worlds. When we were, yeah. It's just had a couple climbs. I think it's going to be because they'll do it enough times. It'll be long enough race. Richmond came down to, just again attacking just before on the short little cobble climb and then basically getting his lead on the descent, the short descent. That was that was tactical master class right there. That was yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah, so I mean, but I'm just saying, even London, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a sprinter's course, it wasn't a sprint, you know, so we can, so, yeah, um, I would say that Paris should be, it could be anything. I mean, in Atlanta too, it was, you know, three guys off the front there too, and Frankie Andrea was uh, riding by himself for fourth place there, so that that was a relatively flat course too. So just because it's a flatter course doesn't mean it's necessarily yeah, it's how they race it. Yeah. 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 So the, those races for sure I'll see um, because they're you know, you just stand on the side of the road and see them. Although I would buy a grandstand ticket for those too, but I haven't seen those those tickets for sale either yet. So either I missed when they were for sale, which I was trying to watch carefully, or they just haven't been for sale yet. I think they're selling all the expensive tickets first and then the cheaper ones later too. Yeah. But sometimes well, also they open up tickets for sale just for the host country too. And if they sell it there, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a chance to see it. Remember, I think the road race would be the 29th of July. Like the Saturday after the tour finishes. Yeah, I can look at my calendar. It's on, it's on my calendar. So the the uh, time trial is on the 27th. That's for men and women, I think. Oh, actually, the road race is the weekend afterwards. So it's the 27th is the time trial for both. And then the men's mountain bike is the 28th. Women's mountain bike, I think, is 29th. And then it'll go the other way around. And then the men's road race is the 3rd of August. And the women's oh, the race is August. the 4th of August. Yeah. All right. Very good. All right. Um, yeah, I don't know how long we've gone because the clock's running pretty high. <laughs> we always lots to catch up with, lots going on. We didn't do yeah. our birthdays yet. We'd like to finish with that. You've got uh, a big drive to get ready for the um, state road race in yeah. North Carolina. Did they did they combine North, it before South North and South? South? Yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah. So, although I think some years last. Two years last year was canceled. Two years ago, I got COVID. I couldn't go. And that year, I think they gave out medals for both separate from North Carolina and South Carolina. So I'm not sure the, what they're doing. I don't hear anything at all from our state association or our regional association these days. So I'm not sure at all what's going on with that. Um, yeah. Is it, so. so I'm working my way over to the birthdays list. I just saw that Isaac Del Toro, which I just saw a headline that he signed like contract through 2029, like the longest contract. Yeah. That's uh, he, he he rewarded this team already with a win at the first stage of the Vuelta Asturias yeah. by over a minute over his teammate, um, Rafael Maica. Yeah, and he, he won the Tour de L'Avenir last year. And we thought for sure an American might have a chance to win. So, yeah. All right, let's yeah. go. The birthdays for, what did you say today was the 20th? 26th. Yeah. 26th. The thing's still on 20, mine doesn't show what date it's been there for, but yeah, first no, the first person's um, significantly ahead of the second person, but they're only 42 years old. So Lloyd Mon uh, uh, Mondroy, who retired, just only oh, no, suspended. Mondori, <laughs> I would say Mondori. Mondori. Yeah. He retired though, um, 2015. So it's been been quite a while. Not yeah, not yeah. a lot of points um, today. No, but he actually was suspended too through 2019. So it sounds like that's how his career ended, uh, the suspension. But number three is a, a rider for Arkea Samsic, Kevin Vecklin. Yeah. I thought he, he was up. Um, I thought he was up towards the finish w with the recent race. Well, in second place, too, just to, the, an older gentleman, too. He's 67. So I guess older. I'm almost that old now. <laughs> but, but Sergio S Santa Maria, Santa Maria, and he was um, a two time Giro stage winner in 84 and 86. Not stage winner, yeah, not overall. But, stage winner, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny, too, because yeah. it also has in 79, a winner was, was a win at, a, at something that's called the Grand Fondo, <laughs> Los Sesento. So in 79, probably Grand Fondo's meant something different then, but. Because normally you don't get UCI points for, for winning Grand Fondos. But he was with uh, Ariste, Aris, 
Erostia. Or how do you want to say that one? Erostia. Yeah. And 86 and 87. And Max rode for those teams at one time when they won a state a team time trial in the tour. But uh, must not have been 86, 87. So. It's uh, Charlie w- Wigelis' birthday. Oh, was it really? Yeah. Just 46. Yeah. EF Education. Is he still a DS? For the- yes, I think last yeah. I saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He is interesting uh, commentary and stuff sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Rudder from America, 63. I must race against Jeff sometimes if he's still racing. Oh, John Tarkington. Oh, John Tarkington. Yeah. Huh. I'm surprised. Yeah. He was the coach director at USA Cycling until this last January. I think he was on Taylor's Koga team. Hmm. Zach Bender, this is a 30. All right. Megan Elliott, 42. Was he on his collective, Colorado collective team? Anyway. Well, happy birthday to all celebrating today on the 26th yeah. of April. Let's wrap this up. We'll come back again with the Giro uh, getting ready to roll. We didn't mention anything yet about the um, other than mentioning that Tidy Pagacha is highly favored, yeah. but um, yeah, we'll see how he races it. If you people say, "Oh, well, he should just pick his days, get his lead, and sit in to rest so he can be fresh for the tour," which he'll have a maybe a better chance now that uh, a lot of the favorites have been injured. <laughs> Crash so. yeah. Some will still race, some might not. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know they've been trying to drop interest by saying, you know, hey, you never know, maybe a dark horse could win, and and Garrett Thomas has got a stronger team than last year, and all that kind of stuff too. So, yeah, um, it's you know, it's always good racing for sure. But right. yeah, I mean, we'll probably yeah, find out just, pretty early on, maybe the first couple of stages, the possible chances for. I don't think I don't know if someone like Teddy Pogacar thinks about how much he's going to put his team under pressure to take a jersey so early and. Defend it for a long time, but we'll, we'll see. Huh? I think we have to be, yeah, consideration because he is he is going for the double. If he wasn't going for the double, I think he would just race it, you know, try to win at will and and make it, you know, really hard the whole time. But, but since he is doing the double, maybe it's not really his style to hold back yeah. at all. But no. he wants to win every day. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We'll yeah. see. Yeah, that that'll, that'll be almost maybe the most uh, fascinating part of the race. <laughs> How, how he plays the win, which you never know, yeah. too. Again, no. so last was it two years ago, we thought you know that Evan Pohl was gonna run away, run away with the last, well, last year, maybe the year before. I don't know when he was, what he was, had, a, had one bad day, you know, two bad days, and then you, even though he won, it was last year, I guess, won two stages after that. And oh, well, last year he got sick, had COVID, right? He was leading two years, two years ago, maybe. Anyway, he was, he was, he was, he had a couple bad days, and everybody thought he was gonna run away with it, so um, yeah. Yeah, it's Evan and Paul and Teddy is a little different. Yeah, yeah, so we'll um get back together and talk about <laughs> more cycling and um thanks Randy for sharing uh, about George and just uh, our thoughts and prayers with um, those that knew him and how he touched a lot of lives. Just um, remembering him today is a way that we can honor him. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Dean. All right, thanks, Randy. Yeah.